So this chapter is about something called chemical equilibrium. Um, and we're going to start off this chapter by talking about a real life example of why chemical equilibrium is important to study. So hemoglobin is a protein that is found in your red blood cells. It is present in, you know, every, every part of your body that has blood. Um, and what it does is it binds to O2, it reacts with it, and it carries that O2 to other places of your body. So let's say that it first binds in uh, the blood near your lungs where the uh, blood becomes oxygenated. It will grab that O2 and it takes it to other parts of your body that need oxygen. But the whole you know, idea about it is that it can bind to it and then it can let it go bind to it let it go so it's a reaction that is reversible it can form that complex between hemoglobin and oxygen and then it can let it go so it can go back to what it was so it's a reversible reaction that can proceed in both forward and reverse so overall this reaction is in dynamic equilibrium and we show this through this double headed arrow so in chemical equilibrium, uh, whatever is part of that particular chemical reaction you're looking at, all of the concentrations of that reaction will be interdependent. So if you change the concentration of one of them, it's going to change the concentration of everything else in order to restore equilibrium. So for example, if at your lungs you have high oxygen, what's going to happen is that your reaction will shift to overcome that change and it'll increase the amount of um, hemoglobin bound to oxygen. In your muscles, for example, if you've been you know, doing some sort of exercise or something, you're gonna have low O2 concentration. So what's gonna happen is that you're gonna shift that concentration towards that side to make up for that change. So that is the main idea about equilibrium, the fact that things are not static, things are changing depending on uh, concentrations being affected and equilibrium being disrupted, um, changes will occur in order to restore equilibrium. So that's the main idea of this chapter. So everything you learn from here on is all relevant to that. So like I said, you will commonly see this double-headed arrow, you know, showing that you can go forward and backward in this reaction. So chemists will commonly use uh, these two types of arrows specifically. So you've probably only seen this one, um, like in Chem 1 and then previous stuff in this, in this semester, but um, you will see this arrow in this particular chapter and also in future chapters. Um, so a single arrow indicates, you know, that all your reactant molecules have been converted to product molecules, while this double arrow shows that you have both of them present, right? Because it can be going in whichever direction depending on what's going on um, with this particular reaction. So here we have an example. We have N2O4 being converted into NO2 gas. So here this is at time zero before the reaction even starts and then this is the reaction has started but it has not reached equilibrium just yet and then finally at equilibrium you have a certain amount of NO2 which is this one right here and you still have some N2O4 present so you will have both present both reactants and products present for any reaction that has a double arrow so let's uh, relate what we have learned so far especially about kinetics so the past chapter was about kinetics and we learned about time and reaction so what affects the time it takes for reactions to occur and so on so how does it relate to equilibrium and the easy answer is it only relates <laughs> in this particular area so all you have to know and this is actually kind of the actual definition of equilibrium is that at equilibrium your forward rate is equal to your reverse rate so the rate at which your products are forming forward is equal to the rate at which your uh, reactants are also being formed again 
because you know this reaction is reversible so these are equal to each other remember we learned about these rate laws these are the rate laws for both the both the reactant and also the product so let's look at these two graphs um, because they explain you know both the equilibrium and also the rates so in this particular reaction we have N2O4 um, being converted into NO2 and we know we'll hold off on you know the states the gas but just so you know that this is a reaction we're talking about it's from the previous slide as well so in this reaction we're starting off with N2O4 that's our reactant so you have a given concentration of it you know obviously you're starting off with a certain amount of it as the reaction begins so this is time zero this is before it begins but as it begins and time starts you start to see that the amount of NO2 starts to increase and then the amount of N2O4 starts to decrease but it doesn't get used up completely remember this is a reversible reaction so you'll have both product and reactant present so it reaches a certain point where it doesn't like it won't uh, keep decreasing and for NO O2, uh, which is our product, it will reach a certain point at which it no longer increases. It just stays at that equilibrium level. So at equilibrium, they, the, both the reactants and the products, they just find a certain level at which, you know, you can think of it like they're happy. Um, but this doesn't necessarily mean they're equal to each other. They just found their equilibrium concentration. Now, what does this mean for rates? Uh, for rates, you will see that as the reaction is about to begin, so before it actually starts at time zero, for the reactant, it begins to decompose, right? So the rate is of a decomposition because it's turning into the product. So it starts off at a certain rate and then it begins to slow down, right? If we're measuring rate, we see that this is a lower rate at a different point in time. So it starts to slow down, whereas for the product, it starts off at a very low rate, but then it increases very rapidly. And then at a certain point, these meet. Where these meet is whenever these rates equal each other. And this also happens to be equilibrium. So that's what equilibrium is when both the rate of the forward reaction and the reverse reaction are equal. And also in terms of the concentration, it's just those happy concentrations whenever they are, um, they have the rates that equal each other. So it all kind of ties together, but I like these graphs because if, it, if you look at them separately, it kind of helps you understand equilibrium better. Right here in these bullet points, it's um, a summary. So it's what I said, but just a summary version. So these are some common equilibrium misconceptions that students tend to, you know, just kind of generate or it's like the intuitive thing that you would think at first, but it's actually not true. Um, so first, the amount of reactants and products are ordinarily not equal to each other at equilibrium. So this is something I mentioned that just because something is at equilibrium, like the reactants and the products, the concentrations, it doesn't mean that the concentrations are equal to each other. Okay, so they're usually, that's why we say ordinarily, they're not equal to each other at equilibrium. That's not what equilibrium means. Although the amounts of reactants and products remain constant, the system is not static. So even though, you know, that graph showed us that the amount of product is at a certain um, concentration and the amount of reactant is also at a certain concentration so this is our reactant this is our product those concentrations even though it's like a flat line they get to a flat line whenever they reach equilibrium that does not mean that it's just sitting there there they stopped reacting what's actually happening is still that dynamic process you have the rate of a product being formed and you have that rate of reactant um, being formed like back and forth forward and reverse these rates just equal each other so it looks you know when you look at the concentrations it looks like it's static but actually it's it's constantly happening it and that is what maintains those constant uh, concentrations at equilibrium 
neither the reactant or the product can escape the system. And there is a ratio of concentration terms that is constant, which is what we're going to talk about. So, you know, even though it's kind of easy to say this is balanced, it's not moving, um, uh, like, and I don't remember what this thing is called, but the thing that Thanos holds, <laughs> um, even though it looks like it's just sitting there, it's actually not. So just remember that uh, chemical equilibrium is dynamic. And also, sorry for not remembering what this is or looking it up. <laughs> you probably hate me. So just to give you an analogy, um, here we have like a country. So we have country A, well actually two countries, country A and country B. Country A citizens feel that it's overcrowded. So they're like, okay, let's go to country B. So they go. So we have some movement from A to B. But after a certain amount of time, uh, we start to see that they, the migration is happening in both directions and at the same rate. So we have populations in both country A and country B that are constant but not equal. So this is constantly happening. This doesn't mean that the same that the amount of people you have on country A equals the amount of on country B. So what's happening is that you have equal movement and this is what equilibrium is. So we have a mathematical, you know, expression of these concentrations that we can use to judge where the reaction kind of is and this is the reaction quotient and we denote it with Q so even though concentrations of reactants and products are not equal at equilibrium right we stated we've stated that several times that it just because something is at equilibrium the reactants and the products doesn't mean the concentrations will equal to each other but there is a relationship between them that we can calculate so consider this general reaction we have just an a you know a b reactants giving us c and d and then these m and x and y these are our coefficients in the balanced equation so our reaction quotient allows us to mathematically express all of these reactants and products at any point in time in a reversible reaction. So reaction quotient can be any point in time. Keep that in mind. And we call this the QC. All concentrations are expressed in molarity. Um, the product concentrations will be in the numerator. You multiply them together. And then the reactant concentrations are in the denominator also multiplied together. And then what we also have to do is we raise each concentration to the power of the coefficient in the balanced equation. So whatever coefficients you have, that's what you will raise your powers to. So here we have, um, basically, let me zoom out a little bit, the products over the reactants. So this is exactly what this was telling us right here and right here. We have the products in the numerator multiplied together. We have the reactants in the denominator multiplied together. Notice that each one is multiplied by its uh, coefficient. So just make sure to put the coefficients as powers. So here for C, we have the X. Here for D, we have the Y and so on for the reactants A, M, and yeah. And you divide this out and this gives you the reaction quotient. So like I said previously, I mentioned how we can calculate QC for any point in time in a reaction. So the value of QC is very dependent on the concentration of the products and the reactants at that particular moment in time. And we can often and will often calculate QC, the reaction quotient, at the start of the reaction using initial concentrations. So let's go ahead and practice writing these reaction quotient expressions. So this is pretty simple. Just getting used to setting these up is uh, what we're doing right now. So remember that it'll always be the products over the reactants. And I'm spelling that wrong, but you get the point. So we will have our products, our O3, 
in the brackets which signal concentration and then we will have our coefficient as the power we are we are raising it to and then for our reactants we have O2 and then we're raising it to 3 and then same idea here for this reaction we have our products and it was just one product raised to 2 and then our reactants and 2 H2 raised to 3 